we're finishing off our series on finances. Yes, I was just like, I wanted to see who's going to make it through our series on finances. Because these are kind of the, the Sundays that you just decide, eh, I think I don't need to go to church. I'll think I'll go to a soccer game or something, you know. But I, really, I told you guys something last week because I didn't get to finish off the message. Well, today we're going to continue with the message. It's not that I didn't finish it. It's that I have a lot of information to give you. And it's not my opinion. It's Bible. So I told you guys to bring something to write with. So I hope that if you're going to use your phone, please don't go on Instagram. Please, please, please. This is so crucial. If there's ever a message after the salvation message, after really knowing the foundation of, of you know, what we stand for and what we believe in, it's these messages. These messages, this finance message will change your life. It will change your life. It doesn't matter if you're 10 years old and sitting in here, you know, or if you're 80 years old. This is gold, okay? So personal finance bestsellers. There's books that I can recommend. Some bestsellers that I love is Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Come on. If you haven't read it, I paid my daughters to read it. This is how good it is. I actually paid my daughters to read it. If you're going to pay your kids to do something, pay them to learn. That's the best. Don't pay them to work. Pay them to learn. And then another one is Dave Ramsey's book, The Total Money Makeover, I can completely recommend. And how about Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? I would say those three books are must-reads. However, even though they are amazing books, I need to say that there is no better book, there is no better wisdom than the wisdom that we find in the Word of God. I'm sorry, I'm biased. It's like the Bible is the book. Can I get an amen, church? Yes, the Bible is the book, and it is the best guide on money. So let's continue where we left off. Matthew 25, 14 to 15 says this story. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. He entrusted his wealth. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but I do want to focus on this. It is God's wealth. It is God to be, to God be the glory. Can I get an amen? It is because God turned on the oxygen today. It is because God maintains our hearts beating. It is because God opens doors of favor and grace for you to walk through. God aligns things. God places people in your life. God brought you here this morning for you to be able to learn, giving you this information, giving you this wisdom so that you and your children can have a better life. Can I get an amen? So it is God's wealth. And this, this master entrusted his wealth to his servants. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag. No socialism here, okay? Each according, this is where I, I want to make, make a point, each according to his, to that person's ability. To the one he gave five, it's because the, that one had the ability to handle five. To the one he gave two, it was because he had the capacity to manage two. And to the one he gave one, it was because he could manage one. As I read this, I could already hear your thoughts and you, you're saying like, see, I knew it. God isn't fair. See, some of you guys read the story and the first thing that comes to mind is God isn't fair. He gave one. Why did he give only one bag to that servant? Poor servant. I feel bad for that man, right? If God had given him more, his life would have been better. You know, and we think like that. We think, if I had what he has, if I had get, been given five and not one, if I got what she got, if I was given the same opportunities, yes, they were given different opportunities, but each one, it was so specific to mention, that was given according to each person's ability. So you might be thinking, I deserve better. You might be thinking, I deserve that life. I deserve to, 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 you know, to drive that car. Now let's just, let's just pause here. 
that I deserve is, is just, no, no, okay? We have to understand that no one deserves anything. And if we actually got what we deserved, we'd get things taken away. Because we are all sinners. And we all have mismanaged. And we have all not, you know, had that capacity, the best capacity. But even then, God is a good father. And to the one he gave, because again, this is God giving. To even the one that he gave the least, he gave him something. He has, God has given you something. And you might be thinking it's very little, but you have something. And God wants to speak life into that something. And the word of God says, if you can be faithful in that something, in that little, then you will give it, be given much. Can I get an amen? Come on, turn to your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor and says, you got something. Come on, turn to your other neighbor and say, you got something. You got something. It can be a little, but you got something. The problem of many of us stems from comparison. The one with one bag is comparing to the one with five. Right? And so many people have not been able to break away from the bondage of poverty for the simple fact that life, they, 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 they're weighted down by bitterness and envy due to the fact that they're always comparing. They're always judging. They're always looking at the person with five bags of gold. Like literally, you sit here sometimes, you know, or we sit through life or we walk through life and we look at other people and we judge them and we're angered by what God has given them instead of working with what God gave you and being grateful with what God gave you. And God is always good. I'm going to say that again. God is always good. God isn't like, oh, I'm going to be bad one day. <laughs> Just for a minute, I'm going to be, no, God is always good. Do we believe that, church? Do you believe that God is always good? Okay, if you believe that God is always good, and we believe that the word of God says that he is fair and he is just. So he is a good God, and he's a fair God, and he's a just God. So now you don't just say amen to that, but then you apply it to your life and you say, okay, then what I've been given is because God knows me. And if he hasn't given me five, it's because he's working on me. Come on. So today is a Sunday where you're like, okay, God, I gotcha. You've given me one. Because I need to get prepared for five. I need to prepare. Today we're preparing for five. Can I get an amen? Today we are preparing for five. That's why I told you to take notes. And some of you are like, oh, okay, I'm just going to. No. Take notes. You're going to want to take notes. So are you ready for more, church? Yes? Are you ready for more? You want more? Do you want a house? Do you want a house? Do you want a couple investment properties so that somebody else is paying off your homes? Yeah? And then you can, like, retire and live off rents. You want that? Well, you need to be capable to manage that. Your next season of prosperity will depend on your last season of responsibility. This is pastor's quote. This is my husband's quote. Your next season of prosperity will depend on your last season of responsibility. Have you been responsible with what God has already given you? He's entrusted you with something. He's placed in your hands something. He's opened doors. You were born into that family, into that business. What are you doing with that? Are you just judging your parents? Or are you just belittling them? Or, or are you carrying that to the next level? Are you running with that? Are you building upon that? Are you learning from their mistakes instead of criticizing? Are we working together as a family in order to help one another? Oh, no, I, I want my son to work and to learn it the hard way. No, you can teach him with wisdom. You can teach your son. You can take him by the hand. You say, this is not the way you do it, son. This is not the way you do it, daughter. Let's walk through this. Let's learn. Amen? How did you manage money last year? What would you do with all the money you got? Oh, but I only had one. You had something. You had something. How have you managed the money that God allowed you to receive? Did you hold on to it? Did you hide it as the servant with one bag did because of fear? Or did you invest it and let it work for you? 
You will not be able to get where you want to go if you do not admit where you are today. You have to admit where you are today. You have to admit, I'm not a good manager. I haven't been faithful. I haven't budgeted. I haven't saved. Lord, help me. Forgive me for not managing what you have given me. Can I get an amen? God knows the capacity of what you can manage. God knows the capacity. He knows what you can administer. Luke 16, 10 says this, if you are faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in the large ones. But if you are dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with the greater responsibilities. Before seeing ourselves prosperous, we have to see ourselves financially healthy. For you to be financially healthy, you need to be debt free. Because prosperity without financial health is like losing weight without breaking the bad habits that made us fat in the first place. I'm working on that right now. You know, like I literally, I am addicted, attracted to any diet pill, any diet fad. Like I will juice, I will do anything to try to get the weight off quickly, but I don't learn. Like that is something I need to admit. Like I need to learn how to eat. And many of you now, something I have learned is how to be financially healthy. In that, before you judge my fat, you know, judge, you can't judge my, my checkbook. Because if something I know how to do is manage money, that is something that comes easy to me. I love it. I love to manage money. I love to invest. And that's why we're teaching on this. Because some of you guys hate it. But in order for you to be given five bags, you need to learn how to manage that. Can I get an amen? We have to be responsible. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that word responsible. We have to be, biblical term would be good stewards. People who do not hide out of fear, but invest, multiply, and give in abundance. Who invest, multiply, and give in abundance. Can I get an amen? How, how do you know if you're responsible? Ready? Let's take a test. You guys want to take a test with me? Yes. Easy. Okay. Do you save? Do you save? How much is in your savings account? Have you organized a budget? <laughs> Have you organized a budget? If you answered no to either of those, you are not responsible. You have to have answered yes and yes. Do you tithe? Burr. The floor opens and Ellen DeGeneres and everybody falls, right? Most people live their lives with the mentality of, I will spend and then if possible, if there's anything left, if nothing else comes up, I will save what's left. Tell me that's not the way that we think. I will pay every, I have to, oh, I have to be responsible. So i got to pay everything first, all my bills, and then I will save if there's anything left. Truth is that people with that mentality will generally never save. Follow Warren Buffett's advice. Don't save what is left after spending. Rather, spend what, it's, what is left after saving. You have to save first. Many of Jesus' parables touch on this investment theme. He who invests is wise, and he who does not invest is foolish. Why? Ask me why. Okay, I need you to talk with me because then I'm going to give you guys so much, so many things. And I need you to write this down. I need you to learn, okay? Because when I invest money, when I invest money, when I invest money in mutual funds, when I invest money in stocks, even conservative ones, when I put that money into something, in a re, into a retirement plan, when I invest money, the money is working for me instead of me working for the money. Okay? Come on. So many of us are taught work for your money. I'm trying to change your mentality to think as the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God told us not to be enslaved to money, but rather for, to utilize money for the kingdom, for a life, for us to live joyfully. Can I get an amen? amen. If you're not saving or investing something, you're still working for your money. You are still controlled by it. You are enslaved by it. Either you learn to tell money what to do or money will tell you what to do. And maybe you're like super much and you're like, no, pastor, money does not give me 
you know, it does not tell me what to do. Oh, no, let me prove it to you. Money tells you daily you can't. Money tells you daily, don't do that. You can't go there. There's not enough. This is beyond your means. You can't go on vacation. You cannot go on vacation. You need to keep on working. Come on, get up, get up. Because if you don't get up and you don't work, you're not going to earn money. You're not going to be able to pay your bills. You can't afford to eat at this restaurant. You can't buy this or that. It's out of your reach. You have to keep on working. Working, 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 working. Work. And you will work until the day you die if you do not manage your money. Come on. Come on, church. Are we learning something? Okay, when Rockefeller was asked, what is the key to your success, this is what he said. He said, I get, this is Rockefeller, you can Google it. You can, you can Google it, Google it. I give 10% to God first. Rockefeller, thank you very much. Smart man. I give 10% to God first. I save 10% for myself and I live with 80%. What? Live with 80%. Pastor, it's hard enough to even try to tithe. I'm trying to live with 90. Now you're telling me to live with 80? Yep, it just got worse. Like every time my husband's like, um, which I totally agree with, obviously biblically, he's like, tithe. And he's like, then ask God to bless the 90 and live with the 90. And in my mind, I'm always like, cancel, cancel. No, live with the 80. In my mind, it's you live with 80. Because you have to, you have to budget in your savings. You have to give to God first the 10. That's the secret sauce. That's KFC's secret seasoning that they put in. Even though you try to do it, it doesn't come out the same. Because they have a secret they haven't let out of the box, right? They have, but I'm going to give it to you. Tithe. Trust me. You're going to write everything down. And if you don't tithe, you're not going to give the same results. I'm telling you this. What? I can't afford to live with 80. I don't have that kind of money to save. So you're spending more than you should. That's it. If, you, if you're telling me you don't have enough to save, then you're spending more than you should. Stop going to Starbucks. Stop smoking. Stop. Stop drinking. Stop. You can't afford it. Lose weight. You're eating too much. You'll save money. Half. Maybe half. No, literally, and you guys are looking at me, but I'm like, if that's really an issue, if you're telling me I can't save, you need to save. You need to save. That's just a thing. So you're telling me I can't sleep, I don't have peace, the, the credit collectors are after me, da-da-da-da, and you want me to pray for you. I'm not going to pray for you. I'm going to tell you to save. I'm going to tell you how. I, this isn't prayer. This isn't, come here, let me pray the debt out of you. No. Lord, give them character. Lord, teach them to be good stewards. Lord, I want a church that are faithful tithers. I want a church that is committed and that not only give to you out of emotion or because, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And yes, I'm glad and thank you for giving, but I'd rather you tithe. I'd rather you be faithful. I'd rather you save. You know, so if you can't give 10% and save 10%, then you're spending too much. Tell the person next to you. You need to stop, stop it. You need to stop it. You need to stop it and you need to save. Come on, tell them, tell them, save. Pay God first, number one, tithe. Pay yourself second. You're taking notes, you need to write this down. Pay yourself second, save. That's paying yourself because that's paying your future. That's investing in you. That's, Lord, I love you. How can you love your neighbor if you don't love yourself? So you love God first. And then I love my, my neighbor as I love myself. The two greatest commandments, all the commandments of the whole Bible, everything is summed up into these two commandments. Love God, be faithful to him. Here you go, Lord, 10%. Second, love yourself. Pay yourself 10%. Save 10%. And then number three, if you have debt, we're going to pay off that debt. Write it down. Pay your debt. Pay your debt. This is not, I'm not including your home. I'm going to tell you how. I need to go quick, okay? Okay. Don't clap. Just, let's just take notes. Proverbs 21, 20. The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Proverbs 21, 20, the New International Version. The wise store up choice food in olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. They're just all of it. Yes, fools spend all that they get. They consume everything. Do you spend everything? Come on. Come on. Oof, in the name of Jesus. 
in the name of Jesus. Some of you right now are protesting emotionally, and you just crossed your arms. You're kind of, you're kind of trying, look, look, I see Rocio, look at, look at Rocio, I don't mean to call you out, girl. She has, she's like this, she's like, that body language right there, that is a protest. That is a, yes, yes, it is a protest. Even though you don't think you're protesting, she's like, okay, okay, I'll receive it. I just, you, I got you, you know, you know, okay, I know, okay. You cross your arms, you're looking up like, ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. I can't wait for this message to be over, can she just shut up, right? This message isn't for me, this message is not for me. You're actually bothered at the fact, maybe you've even thought, first of all, you're bothered at the fact that we're even talking about money at church. Well, where do you want to learn? Where do you want to learn money? On the streets? How has that worked out for you? At school? I went to finance. I, I have a degree in business and administration and accounting. I took I don't know how many finance classes. Hello? <laughs> no, no. They just teach you to get into debt. See, that's why I don't like church. I don't like to go to church. See, maybe you came for the first time. Like, see, that's why I don't like to come. Because all they do is talk about money. The pastor doesn't even know what she's talking about. This isn't true. I can be blessed my own way. Let me just remind you that these are financial principles. These are principles found in the Bible. This is not my opinion. These are financial principles. So don't get mad at me. Get mad at God. Instead of getting mad at God, I would thank God that he loves you so much, so, so, so much, that he brings you to a church where you are going to learn not only for yourself but for your children. Number one, tithe. Number two, be responsible and save. Number three, pay my credit card off. Okay, no piano yet. Give me a second. What time is it? 10.22. Okay. Thanks but no thanks. It's crazy. I can't do that, you might say. Proverbs 27, 22, even though you pound a hardened, arrogant fool who rejects wisdom in a mortar with a pestle like grain, yet this foolishness will not leave him because a fool will always be a fool. I can preach to you. I can pray for you. Unless you humble yourself and you say, Lord, I need to, to learn, you're going to stay a fool and you're going to stay in debt. Wow, that hurt. That hurt. It needs to hurt. It needs to hurt because we need to get better. The average Japanese person as a culture saves 25% of their sal salary. The average European saves 18% of their salary. Last year in the United Sp States, the average American spent 1% more than what we earned. We actually got in debt. We didn't even save on average. That's why Europeans can take a month off. Now that's life. If you don't believe me, Let's, let's start calling out our credit card balances. Let's start calling out our savings account balances. You think, but, but no. You know, you have to say, I can't go to the movies. No, I can't go out to dinner. No, I can't do that because I am in debt and I'm trying to get out for myself and for my children. Amen? Okay, you don't, you think, I'm good, I'm good at saving. Okay, what are your plans for your tax return if you're getting a tax return? Are you going to Disneyland? Right? Are you going to Disneyland? Are you buying a TV? Really? Are you buying new rims for your car? Really? Are you serious? No. Take that tax return, and first of all, they give you a benefit to put it into your IRA. Give it back. Put it into an investment for your future. Love yourself enough and love your family enough to invest in yourself. Can I get an amen? Church, I have a place where you can invest your tax refund and receive an average payment of 15 to 28% interest on your return. And it's not a Ponzi scheme. You want to know? You're like, what? Where is that? Pay your debts. Pay off your credit card. Do you owe something? Pay off your credit card. Proverbs 22, 7 says, the rich, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. Your car at a 12% or 16%. Your credit card an average of 28 to 34%. That furniture, 0% interest, and then they get you at the end after the two years with a 32%. According to the feds, accounts assessed interest had an average of 17.13% interest rate in the third quarter. That means most people are paying a 17% interest on money they're borrowing. That means 
that an average payment of most Americans that they owe right now is $5,525. And it would take you 16 years to pay $5,000 at a 17%. Tell me we're not enslaved. Come on, you guys. 40% of Americans don't know the interest they're paying on their credit card. You don't even know. You don't even know what interest percent you're paying on your credit cards. In this case, what you don't know will hurt you. You need to know what interest rate you're paying off. Pay off your debts. Debt to income ratio. You need to know your debt to income ratio. You guys are like, what the heck? I told you to take notes. I'm going to go really quick. I have like five minutes. Debt to income ratio is how much money you make, I mean, how much money that you have to pay per month. So say your debts are $3,000 a month. You divide that by how much money you make. Easy. Okay? So if you make, if you have to pay $3,000 a month and you make five, when you divide that, you get 0.6. That means 60% of your debt to income ratio. For you to even be able to buy a house, they want you at a 43%. So you need to owe about 2000 you need to be, your bill's about 2200 if you're making, you know, no, 2100 2020 something like that in order for you, even half less. I mean, we are so over debt, you guys. For instance, if your bill's already told you, if you're paying $3,000 a month, you divide that by five, what you're making, your 60% debt de to inc income ratio. Come on, you guys, we got to pay off our debt, but please don't cancel your credit cards. Write that down. Please write that down. Even though you pay off your credit card, don't cancel it. Don't close it unless it's a dumb card. If it's like Victoria's Secrets or something like that, like just cut it up, cancel it, close it. But if it's your only cards, you don't want to cancel them because your credit score will go down. Have you ever paid off your credit cards, paid off all of your stuff, and then you cut them, you cancel the things, and your credit score goes down? You did the dumbest mistake. Do not cancel your credit cards. Why? Because there's something called the balance to limit ratio. I love all this stuff. Okay, so your balance to limit ratio means how much balance you have accessible. If your credit card, they're giving you $10,000 and you only owe 1,000, you are at a 10% balance, um, balance to limit ratio, that's good. So some of you guys have one credit card and it has a limit of $5,000 and you have it at the top. You are almost at a 99% Balance to income to limit ratio, you are the worst person a lender wants to lend to. They don't want to. Instead, open up three credit cards and put them on different cards. I'm giving you this so your credit score can go up, okay, you guys? Then we're going to pay it off, okay? You can consolidate all of your debt into one. Some people will give you zero interest for 12 months. Hey, take the 12 months. Now, don't go ahead and spend more. you got to cut... You cut your credit card so you don't use them. You don't close your accounts. Please don't close your accounts, okay? So what credit cards, what affects my credit score? Really quick, bill payment history. You have to pay on time. That's 35%. Credit utilization ratio, that balance to limit ratio, 30%. Age of credit, how long you've had the credit card, 15%. Types of credit, is it a bank credit card or is it a Victoria's Secret credit card? And number of credit inquiries, you can't do that very often, that's 10%. Don't close these credit cards. Any credit card with a balance, never close it. You're going to be at a negative ratio. You never close a, a card if you have a balance. Your only card with available credit. Please don't close that one. You just go down the hole. Your only card, your oldest credit card, don't ever close that one, okay? Your credit card with the best terms, never close that credit card. Even though we're paying off credit, you want to leave those credits open because of your score. If you have good credit and you have a 17 or 18-year-old or a teenager, raise your hand. Oh, okay, if you have a 17 or 18 year old, raise your hand, not good credit. Okay, so if now, if you have good credit, put them on your credit card. Put, help, help a brother out, help a sister out. We gotta add them, don't, you don't, doesn't mean you gotta give them your credit card. You don't even have to tell them. But now if you have bad credit, please don't do that to them. 
Don't do that to them. I have parents that use their child's credit. Oh, my God. And then they screw it up. And I'm like, what the heck did you just do your children? But if you have good credit, put them on your credit. They will have already established credit. Come on, you guys. Put them on your credit card. Help them out. Let's help our children. Come on. Are you learning something really quick? Now, once you've paid off the credit cards, now you're paying yourself that interest. Once you have that card closed, you're no longer paying the bank interest. You're no longer paying that person. The problem is not more money but better management. The problem is not more money, it's better management. Simple math suggests it's probably better for you to pay off the debt first before you save. I have people that have saving under the mattress, have savings in the sock drawer, have $1,000 here, $1,000 there, yet they owe people money. I mean, they owe creditors money. You are hurting yourself. Pay off your debt. Transfer all of your debt to something with a 0% or a lower interest. Do your due diligence. You need to know how much you owe and how much you're paying. It's not the amount you save, but the consistency. We have to save. If you're writing notes, write this down in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You need to have three months of savings minimum. Three months, three months, think of the Trinity, Holy Trinity, three months. You need to be able to live off for three months without having to work one hour, without having to produce anything, without even going and looking. You could just sit in your house and eat and buy and do everything that you need to do, bare minimum, but you need to have three months. Ideally, I would say six to eight. For people like me that I need to have, I'm like six to eight months, six to eight months or I'm not spending. I'm just that way. So I'm like, you want to spend, babe? You guys want to spend? I need six to eight months. If I don't have six to eight months, we're not going to Disneyland. That's the way I am. See, thank God for pastor because we make a good balance. He's the spender and I'm the saver. So we got to balance each other out. Because if I was the only one in the household, we'd just be like not going anywhere probably. You know? It's literally, literally. Because I'm just that way. But I'm the one that's saying, I need. And so he respects me enough and respects God enough to say, you know what, babe? I'm not going to leave you uncovered. I'm going to provide for my house first. So we're going to work on the savings. Once we get the six to eight months, then everything else, we can invest it. We can put it to work. You know, we can do so many things with it. In order to be able to tell money what to do and how to behave, we need to trust God. You need to trust God first and know that he's going to take care of you. And here we go in this. We're going to close off seven baby steps. Number one, $1,000 emergency fund. You need to have that today. $1,000 emergency fund. You have to have that today. In your sock drawer, hidden in a, in a box, yes. in one of the cans, somewhere, $1,000. Something happens, you know, a tire blows out, you need $1,000 in your next 30 days. You can have $1,000. Sell that treadmill you haven't been on for a long time. Yes. Sell that bike. You know, go do something. There's a lot of things in your house you can sell. Get that $1,000. You need that $1,000. Okay, in the name of Jesus, God is, this is responsibility. I'm giving you homework, guys. You're going to see if God's not going to open up the windows of heaven and just pour out blessing over your life if you do these seven steps. Ready? A $1,000 emergency fund. Number two, pay off your debt. Start with the biggest interest, the card with the biggest interest rate. That's called the snowball. You start with the card with the biggest interest rate, and you pay that one off first. You do minimum payments to the rest. Don't cut it. People are like, I sent 250 here, 250 there, 250 there. And I say, why? I don't know. Exactly. That's why God has only given you one back. That's why he can't give you five. I don't know why I'm doing that. No, you send most of your money to the one with the highest interest and you send minimum payments to the other one. These are for people that are in debt, okay? Pay off your debt. After that, then you're going to start to do your three to six month savings. That's what you're going to start building. Number one, thousand dollar emergency fund. Number two, we're going to pay off our debt by the end of the year in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Number three, save three to six months. That number three doesn't come before number two. Number three doesn't come before number two. Because why would you save money and pay interest to someone else? No, you have your $1,000. Oh, but I feel so nervous. You should have thought of that before you ran up your cards. So you have to now pay your debtors. Pay your debtors. If you have savings of $20,000 and you owe $15,000 on credit cards or twenty five dollars or thirty, dollars take that. Leave $1,000. Pay it off right now. Be free. Set yourself free in the name of Jesus. Amen. You're going to see. After that, now you're, this is ground zero. That's ground zero. 
We just started. $1,000, paying off debt, three to six months, that's zero. You're at zero. You just, you're doing the bare minimum. That's the minimum that your house should have. After that, number four, put 15%, 10 to 15% of all your income in a mutual fund, in a conservative conservative mutual fund. Start, if your company matches, do it there. Do a Roth IRA after that. Just write it down, just write it down. It, you don't have to understand it all. Number three, traditional IRA after that. Then we start saving for other things, college funds. If you don't have money and your kids aren't in a scholarship, they're going to community college. I'm sorry for you. If you don't have money, don't let them get into debt. You're going to community college. You should have studied more. You should have filled out the FAFSA and you should have got a scholarship. You didn't. We don't have money. I'm not letting you get into debt, honey. I'm sorry we're not doing that. We don't do it that way. You're going to an in-state school because they give better scholarships to in-state students. Come on, you guys. Number six, so number five, college fund. Number six, pay off your home. Come on, we're going to be free. We're going to pay off our homes. That doesn't come till number six. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about the house. And number seven, you start building wealth. And with this, I want to finish Proverbs 16, 3. Commit your works to the Lord. Stand up. I want to read it over you. I know I gave you tons of information, but I'm telling you, you do these seven baby steps. I pray over you that we would be a prosperous church that we would be a prosperous church. I've had something on my, on, on, on my heart, and every year we do, a, we do pledges. Every year we do pledges. I'm one of the, the first to give. I'm, I'm for pledges. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm good. If, if, that's, if that's what we need to do to build, to remodel, to buy a new screen, to get new monitors, you know, but, but you know what I, I don't like pledges. And my husband's going to do pledges, and I really don't like pledges, only because I feel like it doesn't hold you guys accountable. See, if you would tithe, we wouldn't have to do pledges. It's because you're not tithing that we have to do pledges. So you'd rather give to a pledge. You'd rather give 2000 in one lump than be faithful every single month and say, Lord, I trust you. Every week, Lord, I trust you. If all of us would trust God with our tithes, if this Sunday we would surprise God and we say, okay, I didn't tithe right now, I'm going to do it online. Trust him. Trust him with your little. I know it's a lot, but when you trust him and you do it weekly, you do it bi-weekly, you do it monthly, when you trust God, if we would all, if we would be a church that trusted God, that really trusted God, then we wouldn't have to do pledges because we would be good stewards. We would be giving monthly and we would have an abundance, but it's because you haven't been giving, because you don't, because you're not faithful, because you're in debt, because you're not tithing, because you don't, you don't give offering. Because of that, we have to do pledges. Because then we're not going to reach in to the money that we save to do remodeling. We're not. Because the same way that we run our finances, we run the church. We need six to eight months of savings. I'm sorry, we're not touching that. We're not touching that because COVID comes and guess what? We kept our building. COVID came, yes, thank you very much. Some of you guys didn't give one cent during COVID. And you know what? That's okay because we have savings. We have savings. The church has savings. Just like our home has savings and we didn't, I didn't do a video, you guys. I'm starving. Please give your pastors food. Bring us some chicken soup. We're dying. And some, some people are like, they love their pastors to be poor. They love to go and take food to their pastors. I don't need your chicken soup. Thank you, Lord. I have a company. My husband has a company. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't earn a salary from here. You know, I'm self-sufficient. Thank you, Father. And I give God glory for that. You know why? Because that's the way you should live your life. We need to be free. We need to be free in all. And this is the word of God, Proverbs 16, 3. Do you receive this word? If, you're, if you were angered or bothered by anything, I'm so sorry. That's just the way that I talk. Mostly when it comes to money, I'm just like, it is, it is what it is. Black and white, there's no in between. You know what I mean? You're either broke or you have money. You either are good, you either know how to work your money or you're being negligent. I mean, uh, it's hard for me. Do you have savings? Then when you have savings and you have a house and you have investment, then tell me then tell me because I could show you what I have and that I'm not in debt and we have two investments and we have our home. We've paid it off a couple of times already. 
thank you, Jesus. We donated a home to church too. And I don't say that to be like, oh my God, look what they did. God is good. God is good. He gives. He provides. He, he, he makes it rain over us. Can I get an amen? Proverbs 16, 3, commit your works to the Lord. Commit your works to the Lord. You have hands. We all have hands here. Yes. Put them out. Put them out. Commit your works. What do your hands do? What, do your, what does your mind do? Commit your works to the Lord. Submit, submit, submit to the Lord in Jesus' name, this mind. Submit to the Lord. Be reformed. Be renewed. May I think the way that you say I should think. May I not be chasing after money, but may I be giving money orders in Jesus' name. Commit your works to the Lord, the word of God says, and your plans. This is a declaration over you. If you've been, if you've just been struggling with money, this is coming. This is gonna break curses in the name of Jesus. Commit your works to the Lord. Trust the Lord. Submit, and your plans will succeed. And your plans will succeed in Jesus' name because He has made us more than conquerors. He has made us victorious, and He has promised over and abundance in Jesus name. Amen. <laughs>